So, Seamus, have you done any electronic stuff this week? Um, I listened to a Dead Mouse track. So, yeah. Yeah, I did. Sweet. It was great. Uh, actually, something I did this week that is really stupid and kind of ironic is I am making a new video, kind of spawned by the um, crunch time of like, the cyberpunk. The cyberpunk team is having to do crunch. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I imagine it's over. They have to have gone gold by now. It's, you know, we're less than a month from release, or we're almost a month from release. So I'm sure, like, the crunch was, like, two months ago. We just heard about it now, and the game must have gone gold by now. But anyway, I'm making a video about this crunch, or that's the launching off point of the topic. And I spent most of last week and on it, and I can tell I don't have enough time to finish it for Tuesday. Oh, and, no. And I didn't finish my programming post because I was planning on doing this video. It would be a column on the blog. And now I don't have enough time to finish it, and the only way to get it done on time is to crunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's sort of stupid. And of course, I spend a lot of time insulting the executives for making people crunch, which that just happened. The person who runs my business made me go into crunch mode. The fact that, that it's me doesn't make it any easier. Yeah. And, and you feel bad about it, but you still do it because it's important. Right. And sometimes peasants have to work for a living. Such crybabies. Oh, uh, yeah. It's so, exactly like procrastination, right? I mean, like, people people are like, oh, you should never crunch, and then like, oh, I've got my paper due. It's like, well, come on, it's the same thing. Right. <laughs> Just gotta work more. So, if, if the video doesn't make it, well, if the video does make it, you know that I worked overtime to make it happen. Um, but I might crunch and still not get it done in time. I'm not sure. Oof. I'm I'm in that weird stage where I can t I can keep polishing it forever. Okay, once you record the audio, you're done. You're locked in, and that's like going gold for a video game. Can't change anything now. Hand it off to Isaac for for editing. So I'm at that sweet spot at the end where I've got all the slides, all the footage, all the words written, but I can keep because I haven't recorded them yet, I can keep fussing with it. And every time you fuss with it, it gets a little better. So I can just... So the, the point is, I could crunch for the next couple of days and still not get it done, because I'll spend the whole time fussing with the article. Yeah, it's that perfectionism thing. And, and you're like, oh, I, yeah. I thought of another parallel. And oh, there's a, this cool thing. There, or this, yeah. I made a note at the end, and so I'm going to do a, a hint of it at the beginning. Uh, my thing is just like, oh, I could do a funny movie quote reference right here, or I could do an in-joke, or I'll have a joke slide, you know, almost an Easter egg, and see how many people notice. And that stuff is super fun to add. So it's the most fun part of the job. <laughs> and you're always cutting it short. Oh, well. Uh. We'll see what happens. So what have you been doing this week? Well, uh... It we should make a nod to uh, last week. You did a, a thing on your own, which is really fun to read, by the way. That whole uh, uh, article about what's been going on and stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah. I was at a wedding. And so got back, had a kind of a short week at work. So I was working a lot. And so I haven't been playing video games much. But I did make some time to play the new Noita version 1.0. Cool. Um... I mean, we both really, I think you liked a little bit more than me, but we both really liked that game. Yeah, it, it hasn't changed a lot, but there are some some significant alterations. Uh, their backgrounds are much better, and they've added more spells and more perks and things. Um, there's a bit more randomization that happens, like the levels can have modifiers to them, so there'll be like... I, I don't know what all the modifiers are, but sometimes there's like uh, more furniture and sometimes there's more of this kind of that kind of enemy. And um, also when you start a new game, it's got uh, 
a different loadout. Like there are there's a variety of loadouts. I think I'm not sure. It, it's it seems like it's a little buggy right now, but it might be intentional. Hmm. Anyways, you know how you used to start off with like the wand with the two uh, shots or whatever, and then three bombs, right? And a flask of water, and so. It, now you'll sometimes start with like a flask of blood or slime or something and your wands are also slightly different it's not drastic amounts of of uh, randomization but there's a little bit of variation in there which kind of keeps it fresh cool the main change though is uh is there they've added a fourth game mode so there's there's normal mode and then there's the daily run mode and then if you've got uh if you've beat the game then there's also uh nightmare mode which is basically just harder, like the enemies are all harder and it's, you know, more intense. But now they've added a fourth mode, which is practice run. And it basically just, it, it's a daily mode. It's another daily mode. But instead of starting you at the beginning with random loadout, it starts you somewhere, somewhere, a random position in the, in the progression with a random loadout. So your wands are way more powerful, and you start somewhere at a higher level, and it feels a lot more freeing because you know when you start off and you're like, okay, I'm gonna work and work, and you know you get all your stuff, and you're careful, and you save up your money and your stuff, and you you know you get down to level three or four, and you're like, oh man, I can't blow this run. I've invested so much in it, right? And so you don't really have a lot of fun at that point. It's just kind of like it's stressful. And uh, so this practice run is really great because it starts you right there. Right, you start playing very cautiously, which is also very slow. That's is something I've noticed about these games. You know, in the beginning, you're real careless. Just leap around, fire randomly. If you get killed on the first level, who cares? But then, yeah, yeah level three or four or whatever it is, you start getting real cautious. And, of course, that makes it take longer to get through a level. You know, shoot at stuff from off screen back up you know, don't let yourself get hit by anything be real careful don't experiment then, with new wands right if you if you, there's like explosive barrels blow that crap up before you get anywhere near them or else somebody else will right and and of course that style of play makes it take even longer so now it feels like whoa i've got like an hour in this run i really don't want to lose it now you know and so that that exactly yeah and so it it makes it more and more intensely painful just because of the perceived loss even though oh i only made it halfway through level three that's only half a level but boy i spent you know 40 minutes doing that so it feels to it feels really awful when you inevitably, right. inevitably die <laughs> yeah so so this practice run is, I was having a blast with it. It was really, really fun because you start off with all these wacky wands and you can, it's a daily run mode. So if you die, you just start over and it, it brings you right back to that same starting spot. So you can be like, oh, what'll happen if I try this approach or try that approach? And uh, the, one of the ones I was doing was I, I had, um, I started with explosion proof and one of my wands was a Let's see, it was a spark bolt with trigger. It's basically a, a wand that shot uh, a bolt, and then that bolt exploded at the end. And so it was this big old explosion. But the wand had shuffle, so sometimes it would just make you explode instead of shooting the explosion. <laughs> but you're explosion-proof. So the only thing that happens is you just light on fire, like, half the time. Right? <laughs> So I was having a blast because I would just drop into a room and just hold down the fire button, wave my mouse around, and put, douse myself in blood so that I wouldn't be on fire. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> As you do. Right. And, like, I would never have tried that at, on level four if I had been playing right. seriously. But, like, hey, it's free. It, it doesn't cost anything. And, and so I was just having a lot of fun. And... And then when I went back to the beginning and started a, a real playthrough, I found myself having more fun and being a little more free with my play because it was like, you know, it, this this approach can work. It can work to just dive in there and, you know, mix it up. And uh, it was it was good. Neat. That sounds like a cool way to take the edge off of it. And then you can, yeah, be feel... I can totally get what you... I mean, then it doesn't seem so painful to die on level 4. Even if you got there normally, you know, oh, I can get here anytime I want. Right. And this you still unlock 
stuff like when you you know get a new one and the progression i don't know if you ever look at the progression screen but i like looking at and seeing you know all the different spells available or checking when i'm going to pick something up oh have i got that before uh you know should i go on my way to get this thing to you know add it to the unlock on the the progression page and that also works when you're in in practice mode so it's it's a nice bonus cool I, you know i was just about to say i should get back to that game but of course i don't have time to get back to that game yeah, I know. Your boss has got you working overtime. Like, uh, do you remember us talking about Teardown? Ah, uh, no? What is that? Is that... It's a computer game, right? <laughs> yes. It's one... It's a voxel-based game. It's real small voxels. It's not like Minecraft voxels. These are small voxels, and everything in the game post... In the game is made of those voxels. So you can destroy anything in the world. And the goal of the game is to just like, you know, you cannot. It has buildings that if you break all their support, the building will collapse. You can set things on fire, blow them up. Oh, yes. I just looked, I just looked it up. Yeah, I remember this. I remember this now, kind of. Huh. So I just, Isaac just like an hour ago came in and told me, it's coming out. I've been waiting. No release date. No idea when it's coming out. It's coming out. And its release huh. day is, is the same day as Watch Dogs Legion comes out. Oh, no. That's also like like three days before the Cyberpunk, right? Well, it's like two days after Cyber Runner... And a week and two days after Amnesia, which I'm, you know, uh, this podcast is going up on Monday. So if you're listening to this, then tomorrow I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be playing Amnesia. I just, oh, man. like four games, not just this month, but in this last two weeks of the month. Three games that I'm interested in coming out in the last week of October. There was nothing I was interested in between March and, like, August. <laughs> and now we get three in a week. It's just so crazy. Oh, man. I think I've worked out what I'm doing. It's going to be Amnesia, Watch Dogs, and Cyberpunk. I think that's about all I can play before the end of the year. And then uh, Teardown and some of the others are just going to have to wait till next year. It's so interesting that they've turned it into a heist game. I don't know if it was originally, but uh, that was the same conceit as oh, as um, in, in Introversion's game, uh, Subversion. Subversion, they, they were turning it into a, like a heist kind of thing. Hmm. Remember the one where they uh, did the big city generator? No, I don't. I never played Subversion. Oh, it never came out, but it was, it was a, a big experimental thing they did. Interesting. City generation, huh? Yeah, didn't you? Man, I I get the feel. I, I don't know. I don't know why I think this, but I'm just like, oh, everyone knows about subversion. Like, it was this big thing. But, like, I, I guess I guess it kind of went under the radar for most people. It's, yeah, it was pretty cool. He had this whole thing where he'd build cities and he had, like, this organic street system. And then he'd do all the interiors of the buildings and had all the... You know the stairwells and all the electrical connections and all the automatic doors were all wired up and yeah i've seen pictures of this now i've looked it up and yeah I, this looks familiar but i mean i've their, never played um, it the video of yeah well no one's yeah no one's ever played it it's um not not because i'm a hipster but just because it never like turned into a product uh what was it I forget what it was called, but it was like a, a some sort of um, time lapse kind of thing. It wasn't actually time lapse, obviously it's on the computer, but it was like city generation time lapse kind of thing where it would it showed it was a video of like the streets all building out and then the buildings all coming up and stuff. It was very cool. Cool. Somebody just emailed me today, begging me to remake Pixel City from when did I make that? Two thousand seven or something crazy. Oh, yeah. Well, you did start on a City Generator, didn't you? Recently? Right, and then I got sidetracked in other stuff. And now I'm doing something else. So, yeah. But that's interesting stuff. So, we just moved into this new place. And 
we don't have any Halloween decorations. One, because we were in an apartment before and there was no point in owning like big elaborate decorations when we have nowhere to display them. But two, we've never been much for Halloween decorating. But the, when I hear people talk about Halloween, I, the sense I get is that Halloween is taking over as the big exciting holiday for kids. It, it's not there yet, but it's way more important than it was when I'm young. So, what's your take on this, Paul? Do you, do you yourself decorate for Halloween? And do you notice Halloween displays, like that people put up on their, yard, their yards, are getting bigger and more interesting or more hmm. elaborate where you live? I, I've never really gotten into Halloween a lot. We would do a little bit of decoration i think you know put up like jack-o-lanterns was usually the extent of it right yeah we do, we used to do that we'd put pumpkins out yeah i mean jack-o-lanterns <laughs> just carving, put out yeah. a pumpkin carving yeah pumpkins. you know what a jack yeah. <laughs> yeah we that that would be our entire decoration is a pumpkin for every member of the family yeah same here it, we never really did a, a bunch of a bunch of Halloween stuff, spooky things or whatever. I know some people really got into it, but it was always kind of a, a low-key stay at home and watch movies, dress up and go out. But it was never like, I don't know, elaborate. It, we never got elaborately into it. Although, uh, in the neighborhood, there are a couple people who every year have this whole production that they put on. And, uh, you know, some people actually sit out in their yard. They've got like a projector and they've they put up a screen and so they've got like a scary movie playing and they're all sitting out there with popcorn or whatever. Uh, right. Like every Halloween is like, okay, cool. Right. I see like people build these big displays in the yard, skeletons, hanging corpses. It's, you know, I've seen people with fog machines or smoke machines or whatever they are, you know, misting up the yard, fancy right. lights and, and, you know, that did not happen where I lived. Back in the 70s and 80s, that just didn't happen. Uh, you know, Christmas was the big time of year when everybody decked out their hall, their house with crazy decorations and just, you know, burned through masses, burned through megawatts of power, you know, in all these tiny strings of lights. Right. And, uh, but, and I never saw elaborate Halloween decorations until really the turn of millennium, I think, is when I noticed it. No, this may be different in different areas, but that's when I noticed Halloween costumes getting really sophisticated. You know, people putting real work into it, you know, less store bought costumes, everybody doing better costumes and more elaborate displays. And I wonder if this varies by region or country, even. Like, are, are Americans chasing somebody, somebody else is doing it way more than us, and, you know, and we're like, oh, wow, that's cool. Let's copy them. Um, because I don't know where it came from. I don't know, did everybody just decide at the same time to suddenly, you know, where, where did the Halloween bonanza displays originate? And I don't know. Right. Yeah. I don't either. My impression is that it's kind of a U.S. thing. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting. We've got some uh, some international listeners. International audience? I don't know. Yeah. Whoever they are. Yeah. We've got some people that use the metric system in the audience, which means, you know, they live outside of America. They're smart and they know what's up. Maybe they know what's right. up with Halloween, too. Right, maybe they know. They have an easier time measuring their displays. Maybe they have better displays than us, because it's easier to put up. <laughs> uh, if only there was some way they could communicate with us. <laughs> so if anybody else has thoughts of this, or if you've noticed this trend of Halloween becoming a bigger deal, um, please tell us about it in the comments. I have to admit, I still don't get into the spooky stuff of Halloween. For me, Halloween was always 
about sugar, eating shitloads of sugar. Um, which and is red no food coloring dye number four, of course. Yeah, red dye, probably some sort of wax coating over just this solid hunk of sugar. Maybe right. some fake flavoring in there. No, no, not sugar. That's for, we're not fancy people. We're not Rockefellers here. We have good old fashioned American corn syrup. That's what our candy's <laughs> yes. made of. Just sealed, cross linked, high fructose, industrial grade corn syrup. Yes. <laughs> you just sit down with a bag of stuff on your lap and just spend half an hour eating five or six thousand calories worth of corn syrup and dye. You can read that either way. It's made of corn syrup and it's made of dye, or it's made of corn syrup and then you die. But alas, I'm too old. I cannot, uh, I cannot partake in that. I get super sick whenever I have sugary treats now. So now I'm just bitter and angry at the world. Uh. I mean... I mean, I don't want that kid's stuff anymore. That's what I meant to say. Right, right. I was just at a, a party that the neighbors were having a, a birthday party and invited our kids over and stuff. And uh, so there's like candy everywhere and the kids are coming home with bags of candy. I'm like, oh no, this, this is going to be all month. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wait, all month? Well, you know, because like this is the middle of the month, and then at the end of the month is Halloween, and so right. it's just going to never end. Yeah, and that I mean that the sticky patina over every surface will never end. Right. <laughs> the sticky patina. It's like I just, I just washed this, and now it has hardened fingerprints on it. I can feel them. It feels like a rough surface. They've already congealed yeah. and crystallized. Used to be hard wood floors, now it's just like high tack floors. <laughs> the opposite. I mean, instead of waxing your floors, you tack your floors. <laughs> oh. And when I was a kid, we also didn't get multiple, like, oh, go to school and get a bunch of candy and then go someplace else and go to a party. There weren't like Halloween parties either. There was just the night. The night. And if you missed out, you didn't get any candy this year. And I also remember that I, every year I'd be like, okay, I'm going to make it last this year. I'm not going to gorge myself and burn through the entire sack of candy. Um, we used pillowcases. It was like oh, this mental thing. Yes. Yeah. It, I remember. Yeah, it's, I, that hadn't it's, gone out of style by the time I got to do trick-or-treating. And I just like the feel of a cloth sack. There's just sort of this mental idea. You go out with a big sack, and that'll mean you will have more, you'll be able to carry more candy. But of course, making a bigger sack doesn't increase the number of houses in your neighborhood or how fast you can right. move. Yeah. Or how many or how many neighbors feel like they need to strike up a conversation. It's like, look, grandma. I've got 50 other houses I want to hit tonight. You just cost me three stops with your chitter chat asking me who my parents are. You're cramping my style. It you was better not just worth keep it. Keep filling up this sack, okay? <laughs> right. Talk as long as you want, but keep shoveling it in. <laughs> right? It was not worth coming to your ha house for this stupid popcorn ball. You got to go to the houses with the splounched de bars. <laughs> Oh, I'll never tire of Homestar Runner references. Yeah, yeah, and you learned over, you gained experience as a, this could be a video game. You gain experience as you go learning which houses are the idiots who serve like apples or candied apple. Nobody ever thinks, what happens when you throw your candied apple into my pillowcase full of candy and lint? It's not going to yes. result in something... I'll want to eat. I mean, I will eat it once all the candy's gone, but... But yeah, I would go through... I would go through most of the candy in just two days. 
and feel horrible and I couldn't stop eating it. No self-control. No self-control. And every year I'd promise myself, this year I'm going to make it last for weeks. I'll be able to have a little bit of candy every three days later. Oh my gosh, I feel so sick. Oh, I still have some sweet tarts left. <laughs> like, literally that. <laughs> Continue to eat candy while feeling sick from the candy I've already eaten. It was absolutely ludicrous. The it's a roof of your mouth point. gets that weird, like, oh, yeah. Patina. Preservative <laughs> flavor. I don't know. Yeah, it's this weird, like, it's been tenderized by all the artificial sweeteners or something. Right, you have so much really tart candy, and I think the acid just takes its toll on the inside of your mouth. Like, the roof of your mouth feels weird. You know, we've been talking about like, oh, back in the day we were so dumb, but like it was just the other day when I ate an entire box of Thin Mints because I was like, I opened the box fool. and why should I stop? stop? Right? Right, they might. If I put this box down, who knows what could happen? It might not be yeah, here well, I don't when know. I get back. For you, maybe it won't. For me, it really might disappear. <laughs> right, good kids. But even when I've got stuff, like I still have that mentality. Of like not wanting to stop eating something because if I put it down, I think it, a lot of it came from childhood where eat it now or somebody else might. Yeah. Um, I loved sugary cereal. Nobody I know has ever said, yeah, I love Lucky Charms, Fruity Pebbles. Everybody I've ever met in my life goes, oh, those are so gross and they smell terrible. I love them. And my brother loved them. And when one box made it into the house, and that would be somebody else bought it for us for some unfathomable reason, because my, my mom would <laughs> never let something like that near the car. She's like, I'd be like, can I have some cereal, mom? And she'd be like, yes, you want this hunks of Invincible brand cereal. <laughs> right? And that's all we get. Like, you know, a sweet cereal might be just, you know, cornflakes. But anyway, so then once in a while, some sweet cereal would make it into the house. And my brother and I would just like, we would destroy the box in a single day, maybe even a single sitting. Each of us eating as much as we physically could. Because I know if I walk away from this, by the time I come back tonight to have some more, it'll be gone. That's right. You've already lost the competition when you walk away. Right. So... The only way to solve that is to eat so much it makes you sick and miserable. <laughs> the only way to win is to lose. <laughs> right? you got to lose first. <laughs> got to lose before the other guy. But I always wondered. I mean, you know, psychology of these things can get pretty confused. Like, hard to parse. Like, what if we were able to have that cereal freely? If mom just, you know, bought it for us whenever, whenever we wanted, would we have still behaved that way? Because part of the motivation for behaving that way is, this is all we get. We'll probably be a year before one of these makes it into the house. Hmm, right. I don't know. Go back in time and live my life over again and see what different choices affect me. Anyway, I'm still jealous of children because I would love nothing more than to eat sweets and that would make me seriously ill now and also fat. <laughs> Somehow we stopped talking about decorations and started talking about candy. I feel like we've gone off mission. I blame you. Ah, all right, fine. Um, uh, video games. Say something about video games, quick. I actually have something about video games. Okay, everybody, this is the part where we actually get down to business. We're done wasting our time. We're going to act like a video game podcast now. So, the 29th, I'm getting Watch Dogs Legion. And I just, I was like, oh, maybe I should pre-order it. And I go to Steam and it's not available. And I'm like, oh, did they go Epic exclusive? No, not available. Oh, no. Are they limiting it to their own horrible, horrible platform? What? That seems to be the answer. But I don't think the Ubi store is even a platform. I'm not sure. I looked at the page and I didn't see anything about a downloader. I think you just buy it on their website and download it. Like via the web browser? 
Right? So, okay, you made this platform in, in gigantic quotes, but it doesn't have any of the advantages of, like, Steam or GOG. It's not going to, like, keep my game up to date, um, you know, let me browse through the library. It's just a friggin' web page, and then I'll download it. Oh, this is going to be so horrible, and this is the only way to get the game. And I really do want to play it on the PC. So I just, I, I just can't believe how bad Ubisoft is at this. Like they, they've been at this for years, and I swear their, their system is worse now than it was when they launched UPlay. It just makes no sense. <laughs> like the more they force you to use it, the worse it gets. Although on the other hand. If you're still going to give them money, then I guess right. it works. Well, I've passed up. It's true. I'm going to buy Watch Dogs Legion. I just can't pass that one up. But I have given a pass to a lot of games. Because, you know, I go to buy a game. Oh, this looks kind of interesting. Oh, requires third-party software. You, you play. Nope. Back button. And this was on <laughs> Steam, you know. And... I can't even it's it's been at least four games over the years. So my hatred of their platform has cost them, you know, what, two hundred and forty dollars? At least multiplied by every person in the United States. Uh it's like fourteen billion dollars, I think. That's how that <laughs> works, right? It's just like with right. the pirates. You know, right. everyone in the United yeah. States would have bought the game unless except for pirates, so that's it works in reverse too, Ubisoft. Right, this has cost you everybody in America times sixty bucks, and that's billions. If it wasn't for U Play, you'd have more money than Apple. So I would like to hear from anybody that has used the Ubi Store, which this must be a vanishingly small minority. Um, what is your experience? Do you have any warnings about the Ubi store? Like, uh, earlier this year, I bought Doom Eternal, and I just played the single-player campaign, but then at some point, they rolled out one of those rootkit anti-cheat things where it gloms on to the low level of your auto, um, operating system to protect you from becoming a cheater online, right. you know? Right, right. So that when and, you play all those online games that you're playing all the time with all of your friends online, that you won't feel like you've been taken advantage of. Right. And of course, as often as Windows goes wrong and bricks my computer, which it feels like that's every that's like every, every 18 months or so, um, I don't want any of that shit on my computer, and especially if I'm playing a single player game and they just like force you to get it because the game could be multiplayer. Like, if I decide to go online with multiplayer, then it can say, hey, you have to install this crap. That would be tolerable. But no, secretly, without notifying me, install that shit on my computer. Like, that should literally be illegal. If I snuck into your house and put something in your house that you didn't know about. <laughs> That's breaking the law. Logger on my keyboard? Right. Just a listening device on your wall, right there under the picture of your aunt that you have in the living room on the, on the left side, just as you come in the door. It's a really good, I'm just saying, that's a, re <laughs> that's a really good place to put a listening device. That's where I would put it in your house if I were to ever do such a thing. Which, of course, I never would. It's probably, honestly, it's in the EULA, I'd imagine. And sure. nobody reads it. But right, yeah, I'll it bet is it's, weird. It is weird, and it's in the EULA. So even if it was legal, they'd be like, but you agreed to it. But it's just obviously horrible. Just obviously just such a terrible thing to do. And makes me, so I'm curious, are there any things like that that I have to worry about? in just, you know, everybody give me the bad news up front so that I can prepare for it. Is Watch Dogs Legion multiplayer? I'll bet it is. I mean, it's an Ubi game. I'll bet, I'm, I'm willing to bet it's got a co-op mode. 
Um, so what do you say we do some mailbags? All right. You take this first one. Dear Diecast, my beloved decade-old laptop has finally given up the ghost, and I figured it was high time to build my first PC. It went much smoother than I would have thought it would as someone who isn't particularly tech savvy. The only problems I encountered were installing Windows 10. The problems I encountered with it were too numerous to list here, but it basically came down to making me reinstall Windows every time I booted up my computer. <laughs> wow, that's pretty crazy. What did you find hardest or most frustrating or most surprising the first time you built a PC? And what were the specs? Sincerely, Ty. Thank you for the question, Ty. You go first. Uh, the first computer that I built was... I don't know what the specs were. It was a long time ago. It was in high school. It was a Pentium 2, maybe? Um, and uh, I had some friends at the time. I mean, they're still friends, but they were uh, really into building computers. And so I bought the components and then they came over and we all kind of put it together together. You know, uh, one of them was like, okay, well, I know how to get the all the pins to line up so that you don't bend them. And the other guy's like, okay, well, I know how to put the the heat sink compound on. And so it was this whole group project. And um, it worked fine, I think. I don't remember anything going going weird for the... F oh, no, no, it did. There were, um, the graphics card was dead on arrival. And so we started, we tried to boot it up and it didn't work. And we uh, swapped out some other components and figured out it was a graphics card. And so we did a return and got a new one sent in, had to wait a week for it to ship out, and uh, and then it worked fine. So, yeah, long time ago. Uh, I haven't really had any recent problems building PCs. I just built one maybe a year and a half ago, and it was fine. How about you? Well, I, I don't think I can ever claim that I built a computer myself. My really my first assembled that I assembled the first computer that I assembled was like maybe 2012 maybe 2013 somewhere in there the Olsons the Olson brothers uh, Clint and Peter who have been a friend of this site for ages um, yes they actually they, introduced me to to the blog years and years ago how did they introduce you to the blog? Did you guys know each other? I went to college with them, yeah. I didn't even know this. You went to college with Clint and Peter. Or huh. or they were friends with someone I went to college with. I'm not sure. Still. I think we were in college at the same time, at the same school, but we didn't know each other there. But anyway, we, we went through right. a mutual friend. I was out visiting them, and they're like, there's this awesome blog you should read. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was a crazy thing. I, that was how I met you guys. That's cool. I didn't even know about that connection. Anyway, those guys basically bought me a computer and shipped me all the components. Um, and I was terrified of breaking it. I, um... <laughs> I have this joke... How many software engineers does it take to change a light bulb? Can't be oh, done. Dear. It's a hardware problem. Uh, yeah. That's how I feel. Like, I'll install all the software you want, but I'm terrified of breaking hardware. And even when somebody even when somebody else paid for it, I was still like really timid and I felt like you know I'm assembling a bomb or diffusing a bomb or something and it all worked out it it all worked out and that machine was really good to me I think I used that for six years and even at the end it was still really good mm. um not really good but it was still you know holding up I wasn't like oh I can't play any new games I could still play everything on the shelves um that it's was amazing the first what you thing. do when you get really high quality components and right. you know, put everything together yourself and make sure you did it right. 
right? I'm always afraid of like, oh, I didn't notice this. You know, I thought this was the right processor for this motherboard, but I see it's actually a slightly different, you know, version number or there's slight difference that I was ignorant to and I had to, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And now the I memory bought this clock thing. speed doesn't match the processor or like the motherboard can't or, handle it and so you're not getting the most performance out of it. Right. And or maybe it's bricked. Or maybe by uniting the two I damaged one of them and I've got to do a return. But did I break it or did it just not work or is it just not able to work? And I don't know. Oh, it's so stressful for me. So I have not done much with hardware except to swap out graphics cards every few years. So the, the latest computer I got is the opposite of building your own PC. The, the one I have now is a pre-built. And you are not supposed to mess around. I mean, I opened it up to see what was in it. And it's just wall to wall. There's no way to add anything or take anything away or change anything. It's like opening up a laptop. You know, everything's right, right. packed in there. You're not supposed to be in here. If you do actually take any of these things apart, you will never get them back together again. Yeah, and everything's put together with that uh, that foil tape that tears immediately if you try right. to take it off. Right. But I do love this machine. I do love my Corsair 1. All right. Dear Diecast, now that there's been some distance between the release of Half-Life Alex and a promised revitalization of the franchise, I'm curious if you had any thoughts on the potential narrative directions the series could take. And also it goes on to ask what I thought of Half-Life Alex. And, um, okay. There's a critique here of the of Half-Life at Alex. If you want to read that, this person makes a lot of additional points, but I'm, I wouldn't be able to address them here. But they linked an interesting video, and I will put that in the show notes. I've redacted the spoilers, spoilers here. Anyway, regards, D-Tech. Thank you for the question, D-Tech. No, I have not played Half-Life Alex, because I don't have a headset. Um, I really want one. And you know what? Uh, you know, I complained at the beginning, in the early days of VR, that they were pretty crappy and really overpriced. But, like, the mid-range units have come way down in price. I think you can get, you know, it's no longer $1,000. I think you can get one for the price of a console, a good one. You but can get the standalone, I think, for, like, 300 bucks. You don't even need a fancy graphics card. Right. Right, I actually hate the idea of getting those because I have a monster graphics card, and it's like, well, I've got this really <laughs> right. good computer. I, you know, I might as well put that to work. Um, but those are all more expensive, even though they need less impressive hardware. It's really weird. Um, so I did not play Half Life Alex, and I've got a whole list, like I've got a Steam wish list of games that I'll play when I someday get a VR headset. Um, Yes, yeah, so, but here's here's the painful thing for me. I know that Half-Life Alex is a good game. People really enjoyed it. I also know that some people have critiques of the story. And ah. it just seems like this is up my alley. This is something I need to like experience this game and and talk about it. And it's like, well, what do I do? What's what's the smart thing to do? Because it isn't like, oh, I'm going to get this, you know, it's not like this game is like, well, I don't have time to play it until next month or the month after. Like, it's going to be a long time before I scrape up enough money to buy a VR headset. Especially, especially now, I just found out two days ago, our heater is, is kaput. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, we have baseboard heating in this house, and I hate it, but, you know, that's what we got. But apparently the boiler's cracked, and the, the whole shebang needs to be replaced. And that's like four grand. It starts at four grand. So that's four headsets right there. I was really mad when I found out about this. Oh, no. With winter coming on and all. 
It, we, we can still use it. It'll probably serve us for a couple more months, a couple more months until we get repairs lined up. And this is like last month or the month before our fridge started making the most awful sound and we're like, well, we're gonna have to replace that soon. I mean, this is this is a normal part of like moving into a new house and inheriting their 1950s appliances. <laughs> it's like, what did you expect? We knew this stuff was old. I thought it might last a little longer than four months. Anyway. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it, it makes that sound intermittently. You just got to wait it out. Who knows? It does make the sound intermittently. We called the repairman, told him about the problem, and it wasn't making the sound. The horrible, just <laughs> absolutely drive you up a wall Right. It was silent the entire time it was here. And he was like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. I can't do any. I, I have no idea. And, and then he left. And we had to pay for that visit. And then, like, four hours after he left, it started making the sound again. So now I really want to replace this fridge because I want to destroy the one we've got. I want to punish it. <laughs> I want to do like they did in office space where they all gather around the printer and beat it to death. Huh. That's what I want to do with my fridge. <laughs> so angry at it. Anyway, we're First, off. First, you're going to show it your closet of keyboards and be like, I want you to understand what's about to happen to you. <laughs> my entire closet full of wrecked keyboards. This grim totem. You watch the sweat form on its brow. That's lovely. That's a happy thought. That makes me happy. I watched Half-Life Alex via John Blow streaming it and and saying mean things about it. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of positive thoughts about most computer games, so I don't know if that was a fair assessment or not. But, um, I mean, it's very pretty, obviously. And it seems like it's a, at least an attempt to move the the series or the whatever, the setting forward. Right. I've heard it's a really good VR game. Like, they really got the feel... You know, VR is still a bit janky. We're still playing around with, like, what the conventions are. And it seems to handle everything really well, is what I've heard about it. Like, it's one of the most polished mm. VR experiences. But this is what I'm wondering. Like, I could watch... I, I could watch a Let's Play of it and just, you know, absorb the, the content and know what it's about. Do I do that knowing that pff, it's going to be years before I get around to playing it? Or maybe, should right. I, maybe I should save it. Maybe I should just save it. But, of course, people are going to be talking about it. Eventually, I'm going to hear spoilers. You know, be reading random comments or, you know, watching some YouTuber and they'll just show some spoilery stuff. And that doesn't necessarily ruin the game, but I don't know. Maybe I'd rather go in cold. Uh, so what do you do about games that you're not going to play for a long time? You know, if you're waiting for a graphics card update or a PC update or to get a VR headset or to get the particular console that this game is available on. There's a lot of things that can put you in that position where I want to play it, but it's not going to happen this year. Hmm, right. I have kind of a weird approach uh, uh, to games and spoilers and stuff in the sense that I'm interested in the systems and the story as, uh, not as an experience of experiencing the story, but as, as the story as a whole and whether or not it grabs me or, or, or resonates or things like that. And so, like, spoilers for me aren't really a problem. Like, I, I freely watch... Uh, let's plays of stuff and I don't worry about it because I don't feel like that's a thing that's valuable to me personally Sure, sure a lot of people just consume or and they don't care if they get spoiled or not because you know Having something spoiled doesn't spoil it <laughs> Like it's still good if I spoil the big moment of Star Wars before you see it It's still a good moment. It won't be a surprise, but it's still a powerful dramatic moment right so you know, spoilers don't spoil things. They just, I suppose they spoil the surprise. But, you know, the whole, this is, most movies are not made by M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> like, most movies have stuff yeah. besides the surprise. 
And so, if all it has is a surprise, it's like, well, do I really want to invest in that one moment? Or or would it be right. better if I spent my time elsewhere? Right. Do I want to sit there for an hour and a half so that I can have five minutes? I mean, the end of the Sixth Sense, I'm one of the dullards that didn't see it coming. So when it hit me, it really hit me and made for a great movie. But it also made for a movie I'll, mm. I'll never watch again. I'll never watch that movie again because that's all it had. <laughs> was that big twist. Right. I remember reading um, Icarus Hunt by uh, Zahn, Timothy Zahn, and it has this great twist right near the end, and it's it's hinted at throughout the whole story, and I didn't I didn't pick up the hints. I was just like, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. And then like right at the end, and and the whole story lights up in your mind, right backwards, like oh, and that's what that meant, and that's what that meant, and that's what that meant, and so it's it was this fantastic moment. I do really like that. But at the same time, it was a good story, regardless of that, regardless of that twist. Right. And so it's like I didn't feel like, oh, okay, I got the twist, but now I'll never be able to read it. I did read it again, just because like it's a great story. So yeah, there's a there's something to be said certainly for for having good moments that could be reduced if it was spoiled. Um, but there's also if that's all it has, then it's not worth investing in, 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 in my opinion. Yeah. And of course, there's the whole thing of when we're talking about video games, okay, even a, watching a Let's Play isn't the full experience. <laughs> watching a Let's Play right. of a video game is sort of like listening to the audio of a movie. Okay, you, you're aware of what happens now, but you haven't had the full experience. And so yeah, well, okay, yeah, yeah. There's something you said for for waiting to be able to experience it yourself and and be there, like seeing it in the theaters or, or uh, you know, being at the game yourself instead of watching it on TV. Um, but again, for me, it's it's kind of weird because I do 3D graphics and I do programming a bit, uh, and I know how these things are put together, and so I kind of see through. The, I can see the Matrix when I'm playing video games. And so, like, I don't have a headset myself, but I went over to a friend's house who had a headset. I was like, oh, it'd be fun to play with. And, uh, and I, you know, played in it for about an hour. And when I was done, I was like, oh, you know, that was really fun. Thank you so much. And they're like, yeah, it was fun to watch you. Like, we have never, he, he has friends over all the time, you know, and shows him the headset and stuff. He's like, we've never, he and his wife, we've never seen anyone interacting with the VR system like you do like there you were you were completely you were completely engaged with the systems but you were you were not at all uh what plugged in to the the conceit of it like I wasn't I wasn't immersed I was always like oh okay right. what happens if I stick my head through the wall what happens if I step out over <laughs> this infinite abyss uh, you know, you know, you've, you're playing the archery game, right? Well, like, what happens if I just hold the controllers down on my waist and like run my hand back and forth really, really quickly, clicking the button to shoot like the arrows like a like a machine gun, that kind of thing. Right. So even like for me, the experience of VR or playing a game or whatever is is probably very different from the experience that was intended by the game developer. And so again, it's like, well, I like for me personally. That's not an uh, an engaging reason for me to to not spoil myself on it or not learn about it or or whatever because it's just it's not going to be the same uh, for me as it is for a lot of other people. Right, right. And for me, I'm I'm the like I've got a giant bullseye painted on me. Like this game is right up my alley. They got me. If I had a VR headset, I would have put, played through this game ten times by now. Ah, oh, yeah. And I mean, that was some of the first like long form reviewing I did was talking about the Half Life games on my site. I mean, it'd be good to go back, or you know, into that world. It'd be good to play Half Life, Alex. I I keep wishing that that they just had a non VR version. But honestly, it's probably smart. I mean, non VR and VR are very different experiences. So it's probably smart that they 
you know, just focused on making one of them really good rather than making this weird compromise game. On the other hand, as somebody who doesn't have the VR headset, I really wish I could. Even if it's a compromised yeah. experience. It's like porting something to console or porting from console. It's just not quite right. 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 Well, this isn't how much more much more pronounced. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for so much for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Bye.